This is all theater. This is all just political theater. Political theater. Political theater. Pure political theater. Theater. Political theater. The nefarious, significant, and protracted political, political, political theater for political theater's sake. I yield back. From Washington, this is Political Theater. Roll Call's review of the spectacle of politics on Capitol Hill and across the country. I'm Jason Dick. President Joe Biden this week declared that the longest war in U.S. history was over, and that after evacuating thousands of Americans and Afghan allies, there was no vital national security interest that justified staying in Afghanistan. But after 20 years, the withdrawal of troops and civilians this summer was messy and deadly. And the images of people desperately crowding to evacuation sites, the abandonment of Bagram Air Force Base, and stranded military hardware has been jarring. The public has long supported ending the war, but doesn't seem too thrilled with the execution. CQ Roll Call senior defense writer John Donnelly, who has covered the war since its beginnings in 2001, joins us to discuss the messiness and how much of it is standard operating procedure, or at least what passes for that in a war-torn country defined by conflict and humbling empires. John, welcome to Political Theater. Hi, Jason. Hey, uh, before we get started, I just want to play a clip of uh, what President Biden said on Tuesday from the White House. It was a sort of a long speech in which he kind of got into, uh, you know, what there, there was no uh, ambiguity about how he felt about leaving. And he also talked about what he thought was a pretty good record for getting people out. So let's listen to that clip real quick. Our Operation Allied Rescue ended up getting more than 5,500 Americans out. The bottom line, 90% of Americans in Afghanistan who wanted to leave were able to leave. And for those remaining Americans, there is no deadline. We remain committed to get them out if they want to come out. So, John, I mean, we've seen these crazy images of people, you know, like rushing to the airport and people like in the earlier days clinging to, uh, you know, uh, helicopters and air, airplanes and so forth and and all kinds of like just bad stuff does does the does the actual execution of of saying like we got out you know over a hundred thousand people where where almost every single person who wants out is done like the sort of facts and figures that that biden cited does that does that kind of overcome what the images are which is that you know people are like whoa this thing looks messed up so it's clear that this was a major logistical accomplishment that they pulled off in getting so many people out in such short order. But let's not lose sight of the fact that uh, by all appearances, this was a major debacle. The United States seemed unprepared for what happened there. The White House is sending conflicting signals on whether they expected the, uh, the Afghan government to fall as quickly as it did. President Biden, in his remarks yesterday, said we were ready for every eventuality, including the possibility that the Afghan government would fall. And and we were and we, and we were ready for that. Uh, Jen Psaki said pretty much the opposite afterwards. No one expected this to happen. This is but, the White uh, House press secretary. Right. Yeah. right she did that right. right after the speech the, in the press. Right. Speech, right after the speech. Right. And and, um, you know, the, the fact is, <laughs> If you're if you're pulling out 2,500 troops and then you have to send 6,000 back in, then you're you were not expecting to happen what happened. Okay, and you can you can make a pretty good argument that they were not prepared for for what happened. On the other hand, you know, for months now, uh, members of Congress and others have been saying that the administration has been dragging its feet on getting these special immigrant visas together and making sure that people get out. So in retrospect, it seems to me that setting a a public deadline for getting out was probably not the best idea. And that the better approach would have been to say, we intend to get out this year on our own schedule when the time is right, and only after we have gotten all of our friends out. And and so I think that would have been the better approach. And, And now we've left, you know, maybe 100 or so Americans behind but I've seen estimates of up to 100,000 Afghans that want to leave the country still that 
are going to have a hard time getting out. You know, there are mysterious, supposedly, you know, vaguely worded ways that we're going to try to, you know, get these people out now. But it's going to be a heck of a lot harder now for them to get out. Now, about the deadline, um, you know, the, the, the Trump administration had neg- negotiated a deal with the Taliban in 2020 uh, that would call for us pulling our military out uh, and, and, the, and the deadline that Biden was facing when he took office that was set by the Trump administration and the Taliban was May 1st. We, we, he realized that that, that was not, that was not going to happen, um, that May 1st was going to be a, a, a far too much uh, of a, of a, of a you know, to hurdle to hit. And so he pushed it to August 31st uh, earlier this year and, you know, kind of made a a little bit of a deal about saying like, this will be before the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, which is what led to um, the invasion of Afghanistan to the the search for bin Laden and so forth. Um, But I mean, so, so you think that like these, these deadlines felt, they, they did feel kind of artificial, but there was some, I mean, we did make a deal, right? I mean, like, we, we didn't know what the consequences of, of extending deadlines would have been, you know, if the Taliban would have uh, tried to start resumed attacks on American forces. Uh, I mean, like, we, we just don't know what would have happened uh, if, if we would have pushed on these deadlines. Right. Okay. First of all, you know, when Biden extended the deadline from May 1st to by 9-11 or August 31st, you know, the Taliban didn't start attacking American troops, which they had stopped attacking American troops. We had zero casualties among American military uh, personnel for, you know, basically since the February 2020 agreement between Trump and the Taliban, which, oh, by the way, excluded the Afghan government. Um, so they had stopped attacking us. They had stepped up their attacks on civilians. Uh, you know, the war had become deadlier, you know, outside our circle. You know, the Defense Intelligence Agency did estimate that, you know, if the Americans cont- stayed on in Afghanistan, I think it's a safe bet that this is true, uh, that the Taliban would have resumed their attacks and that in order to protect against that, at least a doubling of the U.S. forces would have been required. So Biden is right that, you know, the the, the choice was not between, um, you know, a, a happy situ, a happy continuation of our 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 presence in Afghanistan and, and, and leaving. You know, the choice was between a continued presence that would have had to grow and would have gotten deadlier you know, in the next year or two or three and and leaving. But I, I go back to the point that I, I think it's almost always a bad idea to set, you know, calendar dates because it gives the it gives the adversary, you know, that he can set his timer on his watch uh, if he has one um, or his iPhone um, to, you know, when they know Americans are leaving. It's just it's just almost better. It's almost always better to keep to keep that sort of thing, you know, close to the vest. Is what we're seeing too, like that Americans are not used to seeing this situation. You know, we haven't been in a situation for a long time where we have left a theater of war. Um, you know, again, we, we went in, um, you know, like it 20, almost 20 years ago, <laughs> um, to, to fanfare and primetime speeches by, by president, uh, George W. Bush. Um, and when we left, you know, there was no moment on the USS Missouri, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, or at Antietam, you know, there was, there was this situation and maybe we're, it, it's just one of those things that we just haven't, we haven't seen this kind of thing before. And so it is jarring to see the, um, you know, people talk about legislation being like a sausage factory when you actually see it happening. It's really, uh, it, it's kind of gross. Um, yeah, well, well, you know, very few wars end as tightly as uh, World War II did. Um, uh, you know, Vietnam, for example, you know, you had the, the famous scenes of uh, Americans being lifted off the embassy roof uh, by helicopters. Americans and desperate Vietnamese, just like we had desperate Afghans trying to leave this time around. So it usually is messy. I mean, now, you know, it's so much more immediate because of, you know, social media and cameras everywhere. Um, And, uh, you know, just media coverage is a lot better, you know. Um, uh, If you compare the images, for example, as vivid as they were from Vietnam versus what you had uh, you know, from people like Clarissa Ward of CNN, you know, right there, you know, in the middle of the crowd, you know. It's definitely chaotic. It's definitely dangerous. 
so in terms of the images, yeah, there's there's a different um, kind of effect. And Biden is correct when he says that, you know, there's no such thing as a tidy end to a war, you know, <laughs> although, you know, the signing on the Missouri comes close. But but generally speaking, he's right. But that's exactly what you what you expect him to say if he's just screwed up <laughs> the the evacuation and the and the extraction of U.S. troops that, you know, these things never end well. Well, that's true, but that doesn't mean that they can't end better. Right. If you do the proper planning, it's not like we didn't know that there were tens of thousands of Afghans that wanted to leave the country who helped us and many of whose whose lives uh, would be in danger if the Taliban were to take over. And whether the Taliban took over overnight or over the course of 30, 60, 90 days or six months, it was probably going to happen. And we knew that. I want to just play a clip of uh, George W. Bush, President George W. Bush in 2001. Um, you know, announcing, you know, the, that we were that we were invading Afghanistan and that we were going after Al Qaeda. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. Biden keeps coming back to the fact that the goals that Bush set out were accomplished. You know, we got bin Laden. We got bin Laden in in Pakistan uh, in in 2011, but we, you know, we we basically, Afghanistan is no longer a terrorist haven. It may become one. Uh, You know, we we don't know, uh, but there are other countries too that are vying for that. Um, you know, that sort of status, uh, the, you know, whether it's Yemen or Syria or, or, or places like that. So the, the goals were accomplished. And he says, and then we stayed another 10 years. And I just wonder, if, is this the, was there any way for this not to happen? I mean, if we're going to stay there 10 years, you develop relationships with people. You're, you know, you, we went from, you know, into being this sort of a nation building or a police force almost in, in some ways. Uh, was there was there any way that we were going to actually get out everybody who wanted to leave Afghanistan? Because, I mean, let's face it, some people who maybe even didn't want to help us probably want out, right? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, absolutely. And then you never you were never going to get 100 percent of the people that that you would have wanted to get out out. Um, so, you know, perfection is not possible, but but as many as possible is something that you should shoot for. Um, in, in, in terms of the, in terms of the extraction of our friends. Um, but when you look back on the war, you know, yeah, it was like, it, you know, even though it was quote unquote America's longest war, it was in some ways more than one war, you know, it was the war to topple the, um, to topple the Taliban and, 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 you know, expunge, um, you know, Al Qaeda and kill Osama bin Laden. And that was mostly accomplished after the first um, decade. Uh, But then we did stay um, in the hope to prevent it from ever happening again, which, I mean, I thought at the time uh, that talk about an open ended, you know, a recipe, a recipe for open ended, you know, occupation. You know, well, when do you know that it will never happen again and it's time to leave? Right. You don't. It, it, so, you know, it, it, that was that was not a good goal to set. Um, I understand the motives behind it. And, and we do have to worry today that the Taliban, when they take over, will soon be in charge of a failed state, w- which will be a perfect place for the next generation of terrorists to to train. We do have to worry about that. But, you know, as a matter of policy, the United States cannot, you know, stay in every country, uh, you know, uh, with the goal of preventing it from ever again becoming a threat. Now, in fairness, we we had reduced our presence significantly. You know, I mean, there was like 100,000 troops at the peak of this thing in like 2011, when uh, which was the year that bin Laden was killed. And then they went down to 25,000 and 10,000 and 3,000. And the mission, instead of us, you know, being right on the front lines, was to, quote, advise and assist the Afghans to provide them with to pay their salaries and provide their them with training and equipment. So we had stepped back. 
you know, it was um, a significantly lo- uh, less amount of money, you know, from like 120 billion or so to 20 billion or less. Uh, so that's not nothing. <laughs> But it was, you know, it's true. We had, you know, basically scaled this thing back. So that's why I say it was really not not so much a 20-year war as, you know, a couple of 10-year wars or, or a 10-year war and a couple five-year wars or something like that. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely complicated stuff. Yeah. And speaking of complicated, like there, there's been a lot of attention about like the military equipment that we left behind uh, and the abandonment of, of Byram Air Force Base. Um, you know, you, you alluded to, to like, let's take Bagram first. I mean, Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, a Republican from California, said that we never should have left Bagram. But like the 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 con- there are consequences to if we wanted to have stayed there, right? Which is that we would have had to guard it and staff it, which would have meant thousands of people. So let, let's let's talk about that. Was it really feasible if we were if we had negotiated a troop withdrawal to keep? this real estate, you know, kind of like we, we have in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba or something like that. Um, okay. Well, that gets back to setting a deadline, you know, the, 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 of our own making, you know, as to when we have to get out, you know, and then that drives the need to reduce troop levels instead of keeping whatever troops you need to do the mission that you need. And, and you're exactly right that the problem of having to have a large number of troops to defend Bagram was the and that simultaneously defend the U.S. embassy was the justification for not doing it, you know, because it would have we would have, would have required too many troops. Um, but that's only a problem if you set an arbitrary deadline to get the troops out. Right. Um, I mean, I think the better approach would be, as I said, to keep as many troops there as you needed to get the job done. The job being getting our the people who helped us for the last couple of decades safely out of the country. Um, the other thing that Bagram had, in, you know, that that the um, Hamid Karzai International Airport didn't have was, you know, Bagram was, you know, more like. 20 miles outside the, the city as opposed to closer to the city center. So it was more sprawling, more remote. So it's kind of, it, it's a lot easier for terrorists to hide in a, in a, in a thicker crowd. And, um, and there's a lot more sitting ducks in, in, in concentrated spaces in, in a more dense urban situation. So Bagram might have provided that advantage, plus the fact it was already a military installation. Um, but, you know, this is in some, so in some ways, the Bagram decision was a microcosm of the larger debacle, you know, in that we were driven to do something that maybe didn't make the most sense just because we had set this deadline for ourselves, you know, to, to get it, to, to get out. And, and we were intent on getting as many military personnel out as possible, even though we had not accomplished the job of helping our Afghan friends get out and even, even all Americans. Um, so you know that you could argue that that was uh, that that was a mistake, but at the end of the day, you know whether it's Kabul or Bagram, you know um, if you have if you ha- if you have pulled out most troops um, and you're trying to meet this artificial deadline, it's going to be hard to do this well, you know. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. And the equipment, you know, we, we've heard this this figure you know, bandied around that we've left behind $83 billion in equipment, um, you know, and that, you know, the former president, Donald Trump, has said, like, that that we should get all that money back and all that equipment. And, you know, people are sort of saying that, you know, we just, you know, we've left this to the Taliban and they can, you know, like, but, you know, this is, this is what we do. I mean, we do leave behind this equipment. Like, when when we leave theaters of war, we don't take back most of the equipment. We don't take it back to, you know, Fort Bragg and have a yard sale or something like that. I mean, we, we don't, literally can't get it out of the country. It makes more sense to just disable it or to, you know, kind of sell some of it on the secondary market for enterprising uh, thieves in, in the area. But I mean, this is, it's not like they, they just left like, an, uh, like a, a car lot, you know, with the keys and, and everything gassed up, right? I mean, the, this stuff was like the Taliban is not going to be able to, you know, just sort of uh, automatically have this fleet of Blackhawks and, and, uh, uh, and Humvees, right? It's all been pretty much disabled. 
Point number one is we didn't leave behind $83 billion worth of stuff. We spent $83 billion training and equipping and paying the Afghan army and police. But a lot of that was salaries. A lot of that was things like fuel that don't ex- that have since vanished, right? <laughs> so it's not like it was $83 billion worth of assets. So that's point number one. Um, it was more like millions of dollars in assets left, you know, instead of billions of dollars. Well, maybe it got to, the, to billions, but in any event, it wasn't $83 billion worth of stuff that, that we left. Um, and this, and as you alluded to, um, this, the equipment that is left behind is not left behind in working order. It is deliberately disabled, um, quote, demilitarized is the term that they use, which often means blowing it up, burning the hell out of it, taking secret stuff out to the extent you can. And, you know, the general in charge of U.S. Central Command, General McKenzie, said a lot of this stuff wasn't in flying shape anyway, <laughs> which right. we all kind of knew because um, it was we've read all these audit reports over the years. Uh, but anyway, the, the bottom line being, it's not like they've got a usable you know, set of equipment there. It's it's pretty much unusable. Um, however, you know, what it does provide them with is like sort of a totem um, for the, uh, you know, triumph over the infidels, right? Um, you know, they can hold up the, all the guns that they, that they uh, found. Um, oh, the other thing I forgot to mention is even if it were in working order, like even if they got a, you know, a, 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 a rifle or something, um, you still have to be able to maintain it. A lot of this is pretty high tech equipment, you know, and so you have to have the, the skilled, you know, maintenance people, you have to have spare parts, all that stuff. So, you know, the idea that we're leaving them, you know, stuff that, that will help their cause is really, you know, not accurate. However, as I started to talk about, it's the symbolic value of this that is shouldn't be completely discounted. You know, the, the images that they can show of holding up, you know, the infidels weapons or pointing to their helicopter, even if the helicopter can't fly, they can still do a video next to it. Right. And so this gets to the issue of what is the fallout from this whole thing in terms of um, bolstering and um, upping the morale of insurgents around in Afghanistan and around the world, right? And I think uh, that's a real thing, you know? Uh, my gut tells me that this is the kind of thing, the triumph of, of, you know, of jihadists over a foreign occupying power that will inspire um, insurgents uh, the world over, you know? Now, a lot of these insurgents have local and regional aims. They don't necessarily want to attack the United States. So they're not all, it's not all, they're not all the same kind of threat, but some of them are. And I do think we have to worry about the effect of that. And, you know, with, with this finality, John, I mean, like this, you know, you have, uh, you're, you're a veteran journalist. Uh, you've covered, you know, every aspect of this war. This has been, um, even if the, it's not been in the public's mind as much, this has been a, a big part of Pentagon planning and priorities for two decades now. Is there, I mean, you're you know you know these people well who work in the Pentagon. Um, is there a sense of relief? Are they trying to be business as usual? This is just we're moving on. Uh, I mean, I just can't help but think that they're that they're feeling something different now. That like something has changed. What what's the what kind of what are you kind of hearing from the people uh, that you know in that yeah. uh, five sided building? Yeah. Well, they're they're they're. Are a lot of strong emotions right now, you know, and and you know, I, I mean, sure, there's there are a lot of people who are angry about you know how this you know these final days went, um, and think it should have been done better. Um, there's just an overwhelming sense of sadness, though, um, uh, because there's no denying, you know, that this didn't that you know 20 years ago. Imagine if you had said, you know, after we very quickly knocked the Taliban out of out of control of the country um, that 20 years from now that you know after we after 2,000 plus lives lost two trillion dollars and, and well, first of all that the little war would last 20 years no one would have believed you at that at that point but then to tell them that in 20 years that after after we lose all of that the Taliban will come back into power 
I mean, imagine being told that by a visitor from the future 20 years ago. Well, that's kind of how American uh, troops, and of course, they don't all feel the same way. People have different points of view. But I think that's like, you know, you can't avoid the fact that this is, you know, an awful outcome. Okay. But I I also want to say that, you know, I think they recognize uh, the reality that they did accomplish, you know, in some ways what they set out to do, which was they were after Al Qaeda, you know, and they got Al Qaeda. They got, you know, there are very few Al Qaeda left. Osama bin Laden is dead. So in that sense, they accomplished their mission. And uh, it's not just the military that that conducts wars too. You know, it's a whole of government thing. So it's not like they deserve, you know, blame for, for, for the way this has turned out. But the bottom line, they know this didn't turn out how they would have scripted it. And they, they, you know, they've, they cry for their their family members and their their brothers and sisters in arms. You and I are probably going to be covering the fallout from this for a while, but one thing we do know is that um, you know th- this phase of it is over. Uh, as as messy as it is, there is a this is an inflection point, and I really appreciate you uh, you know discussing it because I mean it's a it's it's a it's a real moment in in history, and I, I appreciate your insight on it. Thanks.